I came across a very interesting story this past week. Actually, it was two weeks ago. There was a man named David Ayers, lived in Toronto, Canada. And he was actually living out the dream of many grown men. He was a Zamboni driver. Amen? At the NHL stadium there in Toronto. And David would, would do the Zamboni before the game of hockey. He would do the Zamboni in between the periods, and he would do the Zamboni after the game. Well, this one particular game back in February 2020, four years ago, he was there doing his job. He did it before the game. He went out after the first period. He did it. But two teams were playing, the Maple Leafs and the Carolina Hurricanes. The Hurricanes had traveled to Toronto to play. Well, during the game, the first, towards the end of the first period, I think, the starting goalie for the Hurricanes was injured and had to leave the game. So they put in their backup. Backup goes in. Halfway through the second period, the backup goalie for the Carolina Hurricanes gets injured. And I don't know if you've ever seen a hockey game. They don't have a whole lot of players. And they only had two goalies. And so at this point, they're panicking on injury timeout. And so they do something that's exceptional. It's a very unique rule. Is they go and they, they're scrounging around everybody they can find of the uh, staff there at the stadium and they find old David Ayers sitting on a Zamboni waiting to go. And so they grab him and the Carolina Hurricanes sign him to a one-day emergency goalie contract to go out and play professional hockey. Now, I know every man in here will be thinking, yes, I'm all about that, but you're going up against professional hockey players. How many of us would still be alive at the end of the game? But the Zamboni driver pads up, goes in the game, and he blocks eight shots on goal, plays nearly 30 minutes, and saves the game. The Hurricanes win. What's even more exceptional, now they're playing, it's the Carolina Hurricanes playing the Toronto Maple Leafs. And David Ayers was a Maple Leafs fan, was actually wearing a Maple Leaf shirt under his Carolina Hurricanes jersey that game. It was amazing. He ended up being the oldest uh, uh, debuting goalie in the history of the NHL. He was 42 years old and 194 days. So some of you may be thinking, I'm over the hill. You still got a shot. His hockey stick is actually in the Hockey Hall of Fame right now because of how exceptional that day was. The thing we got to remember always is never underestimate anyone, never discount anyone, and everyone is valuable. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. If you're using a Bible on the pew rack, it's on page 884. 884. And if you do not have a Bible, please take one of those Bibles home with you. We've got others we can replace it with. The Bibles are there in the pew rack so that someone can have it if they don't. So if you don't have a Bible, take that Bible home. Luke chapter 24. And this situation in Luke 24 is, as many of you know, we have Jesus who came to the earth. He ministered for a couple of years, had his disciples around him, poured into them, invested in them. But in the process, some people got mad and did not want to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And they got incredibly frustrated by the fact that he kept going around and teaching the fact that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, who was going to come into the world and save the world. They had been prophesied all the way back with Adam and Eve. Well, these people had Jesus arrested, had Jesus taken, put on trial, had Jesus sentenced to die, even though he was completely innocent of all crimes. And he was taken in the place of Barabbas, Carrying his cross, beaten, as scripture tells us, beyond recognition. Crown of thorns smashed on his head. Purple robe around his back. Carrying his cross beam as far as he could. Then they grabbed the guy out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, who carried the cross beam the rest of the way. 
And they get to the hill where they're going to crucify him. They take that cross beam, nail it together with the upright, lay Jesus, splay him out on it as they rip off the uh, uh, robe. Nail his hands, his wrists, nail his feet to the, his hands to the cross beam, his feet to the upright. Lift up the cross, drop it in the hole, fill in the hole so that it stands there. And right outside of town, so everybody going in town would see this. There's Jesus hanging on the cross. And he dies. He dies at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. And what's so fascinating about this, we talked about it on Good Friday here, our Good Friday service, is Jesus dies at about 3 o'clock. And one of the members of the Jewish ruling council, a man named Joseph of Arimathea, and another member of the Jewish ruling council, a man named Nicodemus, they go to Pilate. And they ask for the body of Jesus, which was an unusual request because typically when somebody was crucified, they would take the body, the Romans would, and throw it into a mass hole and they would just throw dirt on it real quick because they didn't care. This was a criminal who died. They didn't want to do anything with the body. But Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, being members of the Jewish ruling council, went and asked for Jesus' body. Possibly money changed hands. I don't know because this this is something that was never done. But they get the body of Jesus, and they take the body, and they go and put it in one of uh, a tomb that Joseph had. Uh, one of the Gospels tells us they had some spices with them, and, and they, they begin to apply those, and then they roll a stone in front of the, the tomb. But what really struck me is they had very little time in order to do all of that. Jesus had to die. They had to run to Pilate, ask him for the body. They had to run back to the cross. They had to get the body. They had to take it down. They had to put it in the tomb. They had to have all of the spices and, and, and materials there. Then they had to do what they could to dress the body, to uh, apply the stuff to the body, to roll the stone, all before the sunset. Because Sabbath started at sundown. And they couldn't be doing any of that work at Sabbath. And so they had about three ish hours to get all that done as quickly as possible. So it was a rush job. And they got it done. Sabbath comes, Saturday uh, uh, rolls, and not much happens that day. The Pharisees go to Pilate and say, can we have a guard to put there at the tomb so nobody takes his body? They get the guard, and the Sunday morning comes. And the disciples are all overwhelmed with grief, just stricken. You know, it's not just that a friend of theirs is dead, someone they considered family, someone that they loved, Everything that they had built their life around from the last several years had come crumbling down. They had wanted to follow Jesus for the rest of their lives. They had wanted to be his disciples forever. And here he is dead, betrayed by one of their own brothers. And they're just beside themselves with grief. They've taken and locked themselves in a room, scared out of their minds, sad out of their minds, but a few of them don't stay in the room. So look at Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. This, is, this isn't all of the disciples, this is the women. Some of the women went back on Sunday morning, even though Sabbath ended Saturday night, they didn't want to go out at night, it wasn't, a, it wasn't very safe, and so they, they, they went Sunday morning, they had the, the spices prepared, they were going to go finish what Joseph and Nicodemus had started, but weren't able to finish uh, on Sunday morning, they were going to get the job done, uh, and so they, they were going back to the tomb early morning on Sunday, verse 2, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now over in, in the book of Mark, chapter 16, when Mark is telling about this situation, he tells that when the women were on the way to the tomb, they were actually discussing how in the world they're going to roll the stone away. The stone was massive, the stone was heavy. They're, they're trying to figure out, okay, once we get there, how are we going to move the stone? How are we going to roll it out of position so that we can get in there and, and finish the burial ritual? They had no idea that God had already taken care of the problem. God had already rolled the stone. God had already risen, uh, raised Jesus. 
and before they even thought to ask him for help. Their whole reason for coming to the tomb to prepare the dead body of Jesus was unnecessary. Look at verse 3. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, still anticipating a dead Jesus. Either they didn't think that a risen Jesus was possible because it's outside of the realm of, of faith for them, or we, we find out later on in the same chapter, maybe they were too afraid to get their hopes up about what they were going to, about Jesus possibly being alive, and they didn't want to think about that yet. But they saw the stone removed, they go in and see the body not there, and it hasn't even entered their minds yet to think Jesus is alive. Because that's not possible, right? Even though they have seen people raised from the dead, they never saw somebody raise themselves. Look at verse 4. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. They were perplexed by this. That's an inability to understand resulting in extreme anxiety. Have you ever had anxiety just explode out of you simply because you didn't understand a situation? didn't understand why it was happening or how it was happening or how, what the result was going to be. And you just mulled over all of the worst possible scenarios and your anxiety just, just boils over and you're lashing out at everybody around you. That's what this word perplexed means. They're beyond confused. But even before that heart-rending anxiety can completely derail their minds and their hearts, two apparent people just appear out of nowhere. They're wearing dazzling clothes. The idea is that the clothes they're wearing is almost too bright to look at. It's just exploding their eye sockets. Verse 5. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? They were frightened. That word means ex extreme terror. So the extreme anxiety immediately became extreme terror, and they bowed their heads, either in, in reverent recognition of the angels or in, in fear. And then the angels basically asked the women, why are you even here? Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Verse 6, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. And be crucified, and on the third day rise. So the angels give the women a, a reminder. So Jesus told you what was going to happen. Jesus rose just like he said he would. Jesus already said it. He already said what was going to happen, and then he just went ahead and did what he already said. He told them ahead of time how it was going to result. And then verse 8, they remembered his words. Then it clicked. Then it clicked right into place. So really, there's no reason for them to be at the tomb. I said, why do you seek the living among the dead? There's no reason for them to show up. There's no reason for the spices or the stone discussion, how to remove it. No reason for the anxiety. No reason for the fear. Because Jesus had already told them the plan. Actually, if you go and look at the scriptures in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says it seven times. we got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be mocked and beaten. I'm going to be killed. But don't worry. I'm going to raise three days later. He told them seven times that that was going to happen. So that when it actually happened, they forgot. They got scared. Have you ever known a plan that was coming? And when it actually happens, you forget how it's going to turn out and you get all kinds of worried about how it's going to turn out, even though you already know how it's going to turn out? You ever watch a movie you've seen a thousand times, but your blood pressure still goes up at certain moments? And you're like, oh, but I really know how it's going to end. Well, they'd been told, they just forgot. They forgot that Jesus was going to raise from the dead. Maybe they thought it was a parable. Maybe they thought it was just a teaching. We don't know. But for whatever reason, it left their heads. And now that the angels remind them as they're standing in the empty tomb, they say, oh, that's right. Jesus said it was going to happen this way. And it clicks for them. It's almost like in my favorite hymn that says, oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. 
the pain, the anxiety that is often there simply because we don't turn to Jesus and look to him for help and and an answer. And here they are having had been physically with Jesus and it just did not click into place until this moment. They hadn't understood what Jesus is talking about until they were living it, until they were walking through it. It just did not make sense to them. Look at verse 9. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. So they, they've received the completed good news, the completed gospel, the full gospel. Jesus dead, Jesus buried, Jesus risen. They, they, they've got the full gospel, and their immediate response is to go back and tell the other disciples. They say, okay, now we know Jesus is alive, and so they, they run back as fast as they can to tell them that Jesus is alive and he's not dead. Verse 11. But these words seem to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what happened. These words seemed to them an idle tale. These women, the female disciples, are telling the male disciples what happened, and they thought it was an idle tale. They didn't believe them. Maybe they thought the news was was too good to be true. Maybe they had trouble trusting the women because in their culture they had been taught for decades that the testimony of of women was suspect. Uh, Maybe they thought that the words being said and and the people saying them just didn't line up. How, How is this possible and how is this possible that it's coming from you? Maybe Peter's thinking, why didn't Jesus show up to me first? Why is he showing up to you? It doesn't make sense. Why are you the ones who get to see this? It's what you're saying and who you are doesn't match. Maybe in your own life, maybe you've heard the gospel spoken by somebody professing to be a Christian. Some church, some Christian then did or said something that may have been unchristlike to you in the past. And you have a hard time reconciling the, the good news of the gospel with this Christian's apparent behavior. You're saying the person and the words don't match what they've said and done and, and, and how the gospel is supposed to have changed their lives. It just doesn't fit. The person is supposed to be uh, following Jesus and maybe they were completely in the wrong in what they did or said to you. Maybe they weren't and it was just perception. But maybe they were absolutely in the wrong. But the gospel itself, the good news itself is not based on that person's action. It's based on Jesus' action. The good news is not how poorly some Christian failed to imitate the heart of Christ. The good news is Jesus' death and resurrection giving us salvation and eternal life. And so our dependence on the gospel doesn't depend at all on how other Christians act. Other Christians are going to screw up. They are. They're going to mess up all the time because they're sinners. And so we can't put our faith in how well we're going to follow Jesus on the hopes of other Christians following Jesus well. They might, odds are they're going to fail. Or on a church, always doing the right thing. Or on a preacher, always saying the right thing. I'm on a platform, I'm higher up than all of y'all right now, that just means I'm just exposing my sin more than you are. (laughs) I'm probably the chief sinner in the whole room. But we got to follow Jesus. Whether or not you see me stumble and fall. Whether or not I see you stumble and fall. Because my faith can't depend upon you. My faith has to depend on Jesus. And that's where it begins and ends. Jesus. People are going to fail. Churches are going to mess up. But Jesus never fails. Jesus is always right. He's always present. He will never walk away. He will be with us even when we're unfaithful. He will be faithful. Our faith depends upon the gospel and that alone. Because turning to Jesus, we then find healing and we find peace and we find joy and we find relief. Just as we see in this passage with these female disciples, they found the peace and they found the joy. They found relief from the anxiety and the fear when they realized the truth of the gospel. 
They weren't focused on their fear. They weren't focused on their anxiety. They were focused on a risen Jesus. So turning anywhere except to Jesus only brings struggle, only brings suffering, because Jesus is the only way to life. So we should not seek the living Jesus, life, gospel among the dead, all these other distractions, because he is not there, he is risen. Maybe we feel lost in the anxiety and fear caused by this broken world. That just means we need to look to Jesus because the gospel will save you. Substances won't save you. Binging won't save you. Food won't save you eternally. Look to Jesus because the gospel will save you. That's the only thing. Another person isn't going to save you. Only Jesus. Politicians won't save you. They'll abandon you. Only Jesus will save you. Far too often we look elsewhere for peace and for joy and relief. And though we may find it temporarily, it will not last. Every single time it comes back. Every single time the anxiety and fear returns. Because none of those things are meant to save us. They can't. They can't do it. We can pursue those other avenues and try to push down and and, and numb the anxiety and fear, but it doesn't solve the problem. The problem's deeper than what any of those other distractions and things can solve. Only Jesus can solve the problem. Only Jesus can get to the root of the issue. Only Jesus can heal. Only Jesus can bring peace. Only Jesus can give you joy. None of that other stuff can. Only Jesus. Salvation doesn't come from any of those things. In reality, if we pursue that stuff, it only leads to death. And so we have to stop looking for the living among the dead. The gospel and Jesus brings life. Life cannot be found apart from Jesus. You will never have lasting peace and joy and relief without him. Jesus is necessary for life. No matter how many distractions we turn to or how many, time we t- we, how many times we turn to those distractions, Jesus is always right there, ready for us to believe, ready for us to follow him. He's always right there. He's always with us. Hebrews 13, 5, he will never leave you or forsake you. He's always with you. Matthew 28, to the ends of the age, he will never walk away from you. Other people will. Jesus never will. He will always be with you. And no matter what you've done, no matter what your background is or where you came from, no matter the words that came out of your mouth this morning on the way to church, on Easter Sunday, Jesus is still with you. Because the gospel is for everyone. It's not just for the good people, which in reality there's not any. We perceive other people as they've got it all together, but they don't. That's just a front people put up. The gospel's for everyone. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you came from, no matter the stuff that's in the back of your minds right now, no matter what you were doing last night, no matter what you were doing 10 years ago, that somebody keeps bringing up over and over and over again, the gospel is for everyone. Everyone, everyone, look at the disciples Jesus picked. You got a guy who wants to overthrow the government. You got other guys with almost zero education, definitely zero theological education, who are rough, mean, incredibly selfish. At, during the Last Supper, Jesus is telling them for the seventh time, I'm going to die and raise for your sins. And immediately the disciples get into an argument about which one of them is the best disciple. When G- Jesus, Son of God, is explaining the gospel, they're having a side conversation about which one of them is the best. It's like when you're having a somber meal and your kids start doing stuff like that. And you're like, just no talking for the rest of the meal. Your privileges are gone. You're not allowed to talk. The gospel is for everyone. And Jesus picked those guys to be 
the leaders of this Christian movement. And in among those guys, he picks Judas. If Judas would have repented and turned to Jesus, would he have been welcomed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely he would have. Because the gospel is for everyone. Turn to Jesus, you receive the gospel, you receive eternal life, irregardless of the sin you've done. Because the sin's forgiven when you believe. All of it. There's no sin that's too much. Jesus cannot pay for it. We saw that a few weeks ago. You can't sin out of God's price range. He's paid for the sin. It's paid for. It's done away with when you believe. The gospel is for everyone. So anybody who would come and say, yeah, but what you did, that's, that's, that's a lie. Like, you did a lot. That, that's too much. You say, nope, my Jesus forgave that. He forgives all of it. Every single piece. The gospel is for everybody. Everybody. The saint, the sinner, the tax collector, the Pharisee. I mean, why do you think, what I, what I love about this whole scenario is, especially here in Luke, you've got Joseph of Arimathea, Pharisee, member of the Sanhedrin, Jewish ruling council, very wealthy man, being acknowledged as a disciple of Christ. And then you've got the thief on the cross being executed because of insurrection and murder. Just within a matter of a few verses, the gospel's for everybody, all over the spectrum. Because grace is for everyone. It's not just for some people and not other people. It's not that you get this much grace, but if you do this much sin, then you're out of luck. Grace is, covers everything for everybody. And Jesus gives it in an unlimited supply because the gospel is for everybody. That Jesus came, he died, and he rose. All of our sins forgiven, eternal life granted. And that news, I mean, these, these disciples, the closest and most faithful disciples, we say that, but the men who were there in the room hearing the story of the full gospel, they did not believe, right? They thought it an idle tale. That word idle literally means nonsense. They thought these women are coming in here and telling them nonsense. This is ridiculous. You don't even mean Jesus is alive. Don't be telling us that. We don't want to hear that. But then Jesus shows up just a few hours later, physically in the room. The truth of the matter is, the gospel will not make sense to someone until they decide to listen to Jesus. It's not going to make sense until you decide to listen to Jesus. Until you decide to have faith. So you have to ask yourself, are you listening to Jesus right now? And that's not just for the unbeliever saying, okay, well, I need to believe in Jesus. I need to listen to him. The Christian can ask themselves that 15,000 times a day. Are you listening to Jesus? Or are you listening to something else? Some other source, some other word, some other comment. Are you listening to Jesus? Are you ready to hear what, what he has to say? Because he came for you to speak to you. Are you ready to listen? Jesus is calling you. Jesus said in Matthew eleven, twenty-eight, 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, burdened carrying a great weight. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. That's an invitation from the Son of God. Come to me. Come to me, whoever you are. Come to me, no matter what you've done. Come to me, no matter the decisions you've made. Come to me now and you can know peace. You can know rest. You can know joy and relief and freedom. Come to me. Jesus says. And so then the question for everybody in the room, will you come to Jesus today?